Today, we're gonna build something like this. And if you look at those abstract wanderings of the point clouds, you might recognize what this is inspired by. And it's these amazing works by Maxim Zestkov. So let's talk about how I'd go about building something along those lines, and also about a few tricks when rendering those points. So in Houdini, as always, I'm gonna start out by creating a geonode and diving in there. And in here, the first thing I wanna do is create this collider shape that we don't see, but that gives this bulbous spherical shape with which the individual particles collide. And to do so, I'll start by creating a sphere, setting the primitive type to a polygon so we get these triangular meshes and increasing the frequency quite drastically so we have a finely subdivided sphere here. I want to decrease the radius along the x and z axis a bit so we're getting more something like this elliptical shape here and then attach to it an iso offset to quickly convert this into a volume. Just increase the resolution a bit and you can see the faint outline of a fog volume here which we're just going to use to scatter points into it. So now you can see I filled this elliptical shape with points just to make sure they are de-intersected and scattered uniformly. I'll increase the relax iterations to 100, not much happening there. And in my concrete case, I dialed back the total count of points to 16 and entered a global seed of two. So I get this distribution here. Again, lots of trial and error and figuring out these values to something that just matches my taste. The point here is we just wanna provide centers for a copy to points, which we're gonna wire this into like this centers to copy spheres onto. Let's just highlight the copy to points. And in here as well, I wanna set my sphere that I instance on those points to be a polygon with a bit of a higher frequency to increase the subdivisions here. And now I want to have these spheres individual sizes randomly assigned. I'm gonna do that by creating an attrib randomize, wired in after the scatter. And in here, I wanna randomize not the CD, not the color, but the P scale. And this only has one dimension. And now you can see already that these points onto which the spheres are copied now have a scale between zero and one. And in turn, the copy to points scales those spheres to a value between zero and one. Let's adjust those values a bit. So a minimum size of 40%, 0 0.4, and a maximum size of 0 0.6, 60% resulted in this, which I find a nice distribution. Now I'd like to merge all those spheres into one unified mesh that only has those outer shells as the geometry and not those inside intersections. And the easiest way of doing that I found is the VDB from polygons, turning this first into an SDF. That means a volumetric representation of the surface here. You can see the voxel size is a bit too coarse here. So let's style those down quite drastically. 0 0.0025 like so. So I got a high res volumetric representation of these individual spheres here with the benefit of those internal intersections already being removed. In the VDB from polygons, let's check fill interior. So we are writing volumetric values all through the inside of this volume here and then attach a VDB reshape SDF. And what this reshape SDF allows me is to expand or contract this volume. First, I want to use it to contract it to create the shape, which I'll then use to create the particles living inside this collider volume. So to do that, I'll set this reshape to erode and I'm going to erode it quite drastically by 48 voxels. And after a bit of waiting, I'm greeted with this. So that's going to be the initial shape into which I'll spawn my particles. I'll just copy this reshape SDF and paste it and then set this up to dilate the whole volume, but only by one voxel like this. And that's gonna be my collider. I'll convert this back to a mesh using the convert VDB, set to convert this to polygons and increasing the adaptivity slightly to give us a lower poly count. Also, the poly count still is too high for my taste. So I'll use a poly reduce to further reduce the polygonal count to maybe 50% of its original polygons like this. And this is gonna be my collider. So let's attach two nulls here. Call one out source, copy and paste this, attach it here and call this one out underscore collider like this. Now let's start configuring our simulation. For this, I wanna use vellum grains. In the beginning, I felt tempted to do this using either vellum fluids or flip fluids. However, for this particular look we're going for, both the vellum as well as the flip fluids didn't de-intersect the particles quite as successfully as grains did. So let's stick to vellum grains here using a vellum configure grain node here into which I'll wire the source into the first slot and the collider into the last slot like this. And in the vellum constraints grain here, let's highlight this, I want to check create points from volume. And you can see I've got very coarse particles filling my out source here. Also, you can see that those individual particles are arranged very regularly. To break that up, I want to increase the jitter scale and actually enable it first. And the default of one seems fine. 
to make this look a bit more organic. So now what we'll have to do is decrease the particle size. Again, when setting this up with a bit of trial and error, I came up with a rather small value of 0.008 here, resulting in this particle cloud here. And when I middle mouse on this, I can see we just created about half a million points here or particles. For now, let's directly attach a vellum solver here like this. And the vellum solver, if we are dealing with grains, we have to increase its substeps as we are working with quite small grains and want to deintersect them properly. We need at least seven in my attempts, eight substeps. However, we can dial down the constraint iterations, making this a bit faster. And in the forces tab, I want to disable the gravity. So setting this minus nine point something to zero. Also, just for caching reasons, under the simulation tab, I want to increase the cache memory. And that depends on how much RAM you've got available. I'll just set this to 65 gigabytes here. Now let's just attach a null here, attach this to the first out and set the view flag on it so we can see what's happening here. Check real time toggle and hit play to simulate this and get an idea of what's happening here. And you can see the simulation is quite slow. So what I like to do just for testing the simulation out is go back up here to the vellum constraints grain and increase the particle size here to result in a bit fewer particles here. And I want to do this by just multiplying this with a factor times three, for example. So now I've only got around 16,000 particles in here. And when I hit play on the simulation, you can see the simulation runs a good bit faster. However, that is not resulting in this swirly behavior we're expecting. It's just those particles expanding and trying to get away from each other, but not swirling around as we'd like to. To do that, let's just hit stop, save this, and add a few forces into our simulation, which you can do by highlighting this vellum solver and then just diving in here, hitting enter. And then we can see this node here that says forces. And in here, we can wire a few forces. And to slosh those particles around inside the collider, I want to use two pop wind forces. So as vellum grains, as vellum particles are the same as pops, as particles in Houdini in general, they can be driven by all the pop nodes inside of DOPS here, which this is. So anything that says pop, which means particle operators, will influence our individual particles in our simulation. And here in our pop wind, I want to increase the amplitude. That means how strongly our noise here in the wind is driving those particles. Also want to increase the swirl size, scaling this noise a bit bigger, and then the pulse length. The pulse length drives how fast this animation is. And a longer length means a slower animation. So I'm going to set this to five seconds. And I think, let me have a look at the other parameters. Yeah, I think that's how I set up the first noise. So if we go back to our geo level here, again, hit play. We get an idea of our particles being sloshed around, moved around in a turbulent fashion. To add a bit more detail, I want to reset this to the first frame and dive into our vellum solver again, and then just copying and pasting this pop wind here and wiring it in below our first pop wind like this. And in here, I want to set up a secondary noise here just to add a bit finer detail by scaling back this amplitude here. So it's not as strong, but also not as big. So I want to scale back the swirl size too, and then making this run a bit faster. And that is it. So again, let's play this. And I think we're already getting somewhere. However, this is a bit fast for my taste. And yes, I could go into the Velm solver again and in those pop wind nodes, tweak the pulse length here. But in general, I like the overall movement. I just want it to be a bit slower. And the easy way out of this is on our Velm solver in the solver tab, just decreasing the time scale, making this whole simulation run slower. In my case, scaling it down to 0.33 making the simulation run only a third of its initial speed. Again, if we hit play, we can now see the simulation running a good bit slower. Now, what about those particles colors? There are as many ways as there are nodes in Houdini of coloring those particles. And I suspect that in Sestkov's works, noises have been used to color those particles. However, in our case, I want to do something a bit different and also show you a few tricks of visualizing forces and stresses inside of Vellum. So let's go back on our first frame, save this. And what I want to do now is set up a few constraints. That means springs that interconnect those individual points and then colorize those points on how far those individual springs have been stretched or stressed. For that, we'll first need to set up those individual springs using a Vellum glue constraint, which I'll wire in between the solver and the grains here, like so. And in here to see what we are creating, I want to attach a null to the second slot, the pink slot here. That's the one containing the constraints. That means those individual springs that configure a simulation. So if I set the view flag on that, I can see now we haven't created any constraints here yet. To create those constraints, I want to set the group type to points and the target group to points as well. And we can see if we zoom in, we are getting occasional lines here connecting a few points. If we scroll down here under the glue search area, we can drive how those individual springs are getting created. 
And all I want to do here is increase the constraints per point until all of my points have their individual constraints. So that makes eight constraints per point, resulting in this network of lines, which Vellum sees as springs or rubber bands connecting those individual points. Now, in order to make this whole point cloud not too stiff and allow free movement, what I'll do here under stretch is dial in the compression and the stretch stiffness a bit and the stretch stiffness we can leave at that so that's one times ten meaning a stiffness of ten while well, the compression stiffness is rather stiff with a compression of a thousand let's just dial that back to ten as well like this again let's highlight this out here and let's maybe call this one out here out particles like this and again let's zoom out a bit and play that Okay, that's still working nicely. Now let's visualize the stresses in between those individual constraints. So if you wire these constraints here from the solver to the secondary null, we can visualize them and see how they move around over the simulation. And let's visualize this stress and the stretch that those constraints experience. So if we middle mouse on the constraints here, you can see that we've got a few primitive attributes, one of which is stress here. And what I wanna do is I wanna transport this attribute onto our particles here, which currently don't have a stress attribute on them. And to do so, the first thing I have to do is promote this primitive attribute to a point attribute. So it sits on the points rather than on the primitives, the primitives being those individual lines. To do that, I'm gonna use an attrib promote, which I'll wire in after this null. And I wanna promote from primitive to point, and I wanna promote the stress. And then as always in Houdini, there are many ways how you could map this stress attribute from those points here to those points here. I wanna go over two, first one being the attrib transfer, which if you're a beginner might be the easiest way to do that. So first slot takes in the points onto which we want to transfer an attribute. The second slot takes in the points from which we want to transfer an attribute. Let's check this view flag here. And we don't want to transfer any attributes from the primitives, but from the points, we wanna transfer this stress attribute we have here. To visualize our stress attribute, let's attach a color node here and set this to a ramp from an attribute. And the attribute we wanna ramp is called stress. And now we can dial in the range to see the attribute a bit better. Let's stick between zero and 0 0.3. And we can see that worked. So if we bypass this attribute transfer, we can see no stress attribute has been transferred. And if we enable it again, you can see the stress coming through here. On the positive side, the attribute transfer is very easy to use. On a negative side, what this thing does internally is a spatial search. So it tries to find points that lie near each other. So points from this stream lying near points in this stream, which in our case, as we have very few points, 16,000 isn't much, is rather quick. However, if you're getting into multi-million particle simulations, this can slow down your simulation or the transfer of attributes actually. So in order to transfer those points attributes without looking up which point is near, we can write a very short VEX code. To do so, we're gonna drop down a point wrangle and in here in the first slot go the out particles. So that's the points where we want to transfer the stress onto. And in the second slot, we wire in our constraints points from which we want to read in the attribute. In our case, the point numbers between our particles and the constraints points do not differ. So what we can do in here in the point wrangle is just look up the stress attribute on the point with the same point number coming in through this slot here and then write it on the points on this slot here. We can do so by writing out a stress attribute onto those points here, just with this shorthand, and it should be equal to the values of the points with the same point number coming in through the second slot here, which we can look up using the point function. And we wanna look up points coming in through the second slot. In computer science, we start counting at zero. So this is slot zero, this is slot one. So coming in through slot one, we wanna look up the stress attribute on those points, and we wanna look them up on the points with the same point number as the points coming in here, which you can do by using the shorthand here. And then if I highlight the color and wire in that point wrangle here, you can see the very same result. However, this VEX code here doesn't use any spatial lookups. All right, let's save this. And one more thing I wanna do, this stress here now is a bit noisy as those individual constraints have very different stress values. Just for visualization purpose, I wanna smooth out those values, which I can do using an attrib blur. So I'm gonna drag those down here. And after the attrib promote with the stress, I'll add an attrib blur, wire this in here, in the output into the second slot of my VEX or the second slot of my attrib transfer. And in here, the attribute I wanna blur is called stress. I don't wanna pin the border points. I want to have the influence type via proximity and not via connectivity, have a maximum number of neighbors of maybe 32 and do a rather high number of blurring iterations, blurring this out quite well to say eight iterations. So now I've got a very smooth distribution of this stress value and my color respectively.
And that already is it. What I'd suggest now before we increase the simulations resolution again is drop down a file cache to cache out our simulation results and wiring this in either after our point wrangle or IATRIP transfer, depending on which way you go. And then again, back into our vellum constraints grain, just removing this multiplier here and resetting our simulation to the first frame. You can see a very dense simulation mesh here. And then either you could run this for a few frames to check if everything still works as you wanted it to, or as I'm pretty confident, I got the right settings here because I prepared this and tried this out a few times, is just go to the file cache and save this to disk. And for this tutorial, I already prepared a cache. So let me just paste that file cache I prepared here. That's this one. And let's wire this into our color here. And if we hit play, we can see the simulation running nicely here. All right, let's attach a null, call this one out and talk a bit about rendering this. So in this case, I used Octane Render. And sometimes I get the feeling that people get a bit confused or irritated why we use multiple render engines. And that's just our experience from production. I mean, we come from commercial production. That means the pipelines are not set in stone. We are rather flexible. We don't have huge render farms. So we are not married to one render engine or the other. And frankly, most render engines can be used to get the job done. It's just a matter of interest. Sometimes we want to try out new features in a certain software package. Sometimes we are limited by the hardware we have available. For example, when I'm traveling, I really love 3 Delight as it has really great cloud rendering capability. When I'm on the workstation with multiple GPUs, I love Redshift, I love my Octane. If I have something complex, including volume procedurals, it's still Mantra for me. And sometimes out of pure intrigue, it's Karma. So in this case, I decided on rendering this with Octane. So let's set this up by going up to the OBJ level, closing these three tabs here, pinning this tab here and hitting Control T twice to create an output and a material context. And then in my Octane shelf, I'll click on the render target and Octane button, creating this render target in the MATNET, which I find still very confusing and a very, very weird decision from the devs. And in here, I wanna set up my render engine to be path tracing and set the environment to be a texture. And in my texture environment here, I wanna make sure my color space is a non-color data. That means linear data. And then I wanna set the file name to a texture which I downloaded from free HDR library. And I found it helpful to increase its power quite drastically to eight times its original strength. Let's also add a camera to our scene by control clicking on the camera icon here. And this will automatically lock our camera to the viewport so we can position it by just moving it in the viewport. Also in our OBJ tab, let's add a background by creating a grid, diving in there, setting this to sit on the XY plane, adding UV textures, which is projected along the Z axis like this, and then parenting this to the camera like so, and then just translating it back to say minus 10 units. So it now always sits behind the camera, no matter where I move that camera. In our material tab also, let's create two material builders, octane material builders. That's where we'll set up the materials. Let's call one particles, copy paste this and call the other one BG for background. And let's start with the BG with the background here. In here, instead of using this universal material, which is inspired by the Disney principle BXDF, I think, which is a shading model, which I personally quite dislike because I think it technically limits you too much. It's great if you want to create an animated Pixar movie where 90 or 95% of your shaders are captured by what this material here does. However, in our case, I want to stick to the Octane Glossy material, which I'll wire into the material out. Set the diffuse to a rather dark gray or maybe just full black for now. And then I want to add a bit of texture to the roughness slot here. To do that, I'll create an image grayscale texture node here, followed by a gradient tool to adjust those values. The texture output goes into the input here, and then the gradient's output goes into the roughness output here. And also I wanna be able to scale and transform this image here. So I'm gonna use a transform 3D, which I'll wire into the transform here. As for the texture in here, I used Polyhaven to download a concrete texture, and I'll just select that here, which is this one. And I want to set my color space to linear sRGB and legacy gamma and increase my gamma to 2.2. That is just an artistic decision to make the roughness stand out a bit more. Let's start our Octane's IPR. So everything is purple and we don't see any particles. Let's start fixing the purple thing first by going to the mat and dragging this BG material onto the background here. So now we can see we've got a black background, meaning our material came through. Let's also go into the Octane render target here and in the text environment, maybe first try increasing the power here. And then let's try 
making these particles appear by going into our OBJ level here. And on the geo where we created those particles in the Octane tab, first let's export a few attributes from those points. Maybe for one under the point vectors, let's export the color, but also under the point floats, let's export the stress value. And then on the particles tab, check render as sphere particles. And now if we stop and restart the rendering, we can now see those particles appearing. Also in our camera, I want to set up the focus, which Octane by default is using an autofocus, so trying to get the center parts of the image sharp. So let's uncheck the lock and zoom out here a bit so I can see the camera, select that camera node, and with the tool handle activated, pressing Z over the viewport to dial in the focal point here, like this, and also the area that's in focus, so everything is in focus here. Let's just drag this out drastically. Okay, now this purple here, definitely not what I want. So in the geo node here where we created particles under the render tab, let's just select our octane particles material here. And now we can see we've got at least white particles. So to dial in the material here, let's go into the particles here and again, delete the universal material. And in this case, I wanna use a mixture of two materials. So using a material mixer, whose output will be the material output. And I wanna use a fall off, that means a Fresnel, going to the amount slot, mixing between those two materials that I'll create now. The first one being a glossy material with the roughness set to 0.1 and its index of refraction set to one as well. So this, when we pipe it in directly into the material out like this and maybe refresh our rendering, we can see is now fully glossy, like a very rough aluminum or very silver. And we're gonna use that as the coating for this material on the edges. That's why we wire it in the first slot here of our material mixer. So when we wire the material mixer into our material out now, we can see we are only getting this effect at the edges. And let's use a diffuse material again, wire that into the material two slot and maybe decrease its diffuse to all black. And now we can see this slight outline here coming from the glossy material. If we want to get that a bit stronger, we can decrease our fall off skew factor in the procedural fall off here. And in my renderings, I used a value of 2.5 here like this. Okay, for the diffuse material in here, I wanna do a few things. So in the material diffuse, I wanna import first the float vertex attribute called stress that we created and use that and pipe it into a gradient again to remap this to a color value. So stress goes into the input and then our gradient's output goes for one into the diffuse slot here. So if we now refresh that and maybe go to a later frame where we have some stresses in our simulation and hit re-render, we pretty much don't see much here. And that is because our stress value only goes between zero and 0 0.3. Remember those values we dialed in the color slot when shading it in the viewport. So to remapping this, I'll use a range tool, which I'll wire in between the node loading up our vertex attribute and the gradient and making sure we are remapping a value ranging between zero and 0 0.3 to a value ranging between zero and one. And now you can see those brighter areas coming up here where the stresses are. Now what I can do in my gradient tool here is dial in some colors, adding a few nodes here, maybe making this kind of bluish, then going to white, whitish, and maybe then to some coral color here like this. And we could dial in those forever. That's where the art direction comes in, which is one of those areas that Maxim Zeskov, for example, does so brilliantly. I'll just stick with something like this, but in the final render file I'll provide, you will see I tweaked this a bit better and a bit more carefully than I did here. Also, I not only want this color to appear in our diffuse color here, but I also want a slight emission. And to set that up, I'll drag over the color creation nodes and in here add a texture emission and use our color as the efficiency here. And then in here, check surface brightness. And let's start with the power set to one wired into our diffuse materials emission slot here. So if we refresh the rendering now, we can see this is getting bright. So let's decrease that emission power here to say 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, something around that. A few more tweaks I wanna make. By default, this viewport and the rendering pipeline is set up to use ACES OCIO, which is totally fine. Just for my quick and dirty preview renders, I wanna do pretty much every comping in here. And to do that, the first thing I'm gonna do in the Octane Out under the Output tab here is set my color space to sRGB. And then if I refresh this rendering, you can see already the colors look a good bit different. And what I can then do is under the Matte and the Render Target here is in our Imager tab, drag this down, check Neutral Response and set our response curve to some of those filmic tone map curves that come from classic analog film. And also I can dial in 
my exposure, my saturation, a bit of vignetting, my gamma, as well as my highlight compression. So in here, I'll add a good bit of highlight compression, bringing back those brightish values. But also I want to increase the saturate to white. So that means where we have those overblown areas, where we're getting these bright areas, we're desaturating our rendering a good bit. You can see that in those areas here when you watch what happens while I'm dialing in this value here. You can see the bluish colors here getting quite desaturated. Let's set this to something around 0 0.7 and also bring back those highlights a bit and also dial up our gamma a tiny bit. And now what I need to do is dial in on the one hand our environment here. So for example, rotating this until our reflections seem to hit both our particles here as well as the backdrop here. And now you can see this reflection texture we put on there coming through really nicely. Yeah, I don't know, let's stick with something like this maybe. And now for final rendering, what I want to do is first in the out context here, make sure under motion blur, we enable particles motion blur. And if we hit refresh on that, we can now see those particles getting blurry as they move around and have their motion vectors respected by the motion blur now. However, the motion blur is a bit too strong for my taste. So let's check override camera shutter time and dial this back to, I don't know, 0 0.3. And again, refresh that rendering. And now we are getting a bit more subtle motion blur in here. All right, for final rendering under the matte render target here in the path tracing kernel, I don't need as many specular bounces. So let's set them down to eight. I don't want nested dielectrics or alpha shadows. I want to clamp my GI, so secondary light strength to maybe 10. We are not having really bright lights in here currently. Then I want to uncheck minimize net traffic just to make the update a bit more uniform and quicker. And then I want to check adaptive sampling and set the minimum number of adaptive samples to 16. So what adaptive sampling does is for each pixel or pixel group of two by two pixels, but let's set it to for each pixel, Octane tries to gauge when the rendering noise is below a certain threshold. And if it is so, this pixel is marked as fully converged and not updated by the rendering engine anymore, saving computational power to work on those pixels that have not converged yet. So how do you find out the noise threshold that's good for your rendering and that resolves the rendering without spending too much time on parts that are already noise free enough? Well, up here under the AOVs and the auxiliary slot here, I'll have this noise AOV. So let's check that. And now under the AOVs, I can check this noise here. And all areas that are green are those areas that Octane thinks are fully converged. Again, using the path tracing kernel down here, this noise threshold. In my case, I think 1024 samples are enough to get this image decently converged. Just let's increase the noise threshold a bit. So the other areas, which are also quite noise free, converge faster. And let's restart this rendering here and have a look at this rendering here as well as the noise AOVs. So you can see this image converges really fast now. And if we check the beauty tab again, most areas have an okay amount of noise. The most crucial maybe being those with the motion blur, but in this case, I think we can live with it. So that is how I set up the rendering. The only thing I've got to do now is in the Octane ROP here under the output. In my case, I want to select, let's scroll down PNG 16 bit. And what I like to do is break up this expression here in a matter that we are creating a subfolder using our current file name and then just storing four digit PNGs in there for the animation. And then all I've got to do is set the valid frame range to render the frame range. That means our whole animation and then click render to disk to render this out. And that is it. So a really quick one, a really fun one for today. Again, what we did, let's go back to our OBJ is we set up a particle simulation here by first generating some abstract shape here, consisting out of a few spheres intersecting, turning them into a source that sits inside this collider that we created here, generating grains, that means particles out of the source, then connecting those with individual constraints, connecting nearby points, and then simulating those and moving those points around with the help of two pop wind noises we set up. And then after that, using an attrib promote and an attrib blur to write the stress of our constraints connecting those points onto the points and visualizing that using a color node after we cached out those points. As for rendering, we created two materials, one background material where we pretty much just loaded a texture image in there, which we'll use as a roughness texture. And we scaled it a bit, but well, we actually didn't. <laughs> we could have scaled it a bit using this node here and could have remapped those color values using this gradient here. So if you want to dial in that look, you can use those two nodes. And then 
for a particle material, we loaded in our stress attribute from those points, made sure it sits in the proper range to make sure we can actually visualize those values. And then again, use the gradient, choosing a few colors here to generate those colors, which we then piped onto our emission, as well as our diffuse and our material diffuse, and then mixed with the high gloss material to create our particles material. Mix that with an HDR, which we set up in our texture environment and a few adjustments in our adaptive sampler, as well as our camera imager. And we are getting a really neat baseline rendering, which we can then take into compositing. So if you like these topics and maybe want to learn more about vellum, about volumes, particles, and maybe a bit of Houdini in general, or if you plainly like what we're doing and want to support us, consider becoming a patron of ours, as it's through the help of our patrons that we can keep Integma running as we do. And to anyone already supporting us, thank you so much for your support. With a very special thank you going out to Important Looking Pirates, Jellyfish Pictures, The Mill, Electric Theater, Random 42, Rodeo Effects, Side Effects, Lusion, and Rafik Anadol Studios. Thanks so much for your support. So, as always, intrigued to see your artwork, so tag us, send us a message, and until next time, as always, it's cheers and goodbye.